We are lucky enough to have Mark Stauffer uh, in person on a Zoom uh, to discuss his recent revelations on the uh, Sunday show on TVNZ, which I think uh, came as a shock to many. I know that uh, uh, a lot of people have chosen to break their silence, Mark, and, and you were one of them. And, um, you know, what sort of courage did it take to actually get up there and, uh, and talk about this publicly? Hi, Leanne. Yeah, well, you know, the thing about it is, I guess, I'm in my 50s now, and these events happened to me when I was in my early teens. So it's nearly, you know, it's, it's a half century ago. So it's taken me about that long to process it and get on with it. And, um, you know, and be also being very much aware that um, that whole victimhood mentality is not is not a great thing. I'm a reasonably strong person, so mm -hmm. I don't think it's affected me as much as it has some of the boys. I mean, some of the lads, we've had suicides. I mean, absolutely horrific things, a lot of drug addiction and a lot of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I'm not saying that I haven't had a fairly nihilistic kind of past, but I just felt that the time was ripe to start putting more pressure on Dilworth, who've acted in a kind of really legalistic and entitled way. Um, I think that the Do With Trust Board still has the attitude that, hey, you know, you guys were actually really lucky to get that great education. Oh, there was a bit of there was a bit of ass raping going on, but but you know, we won't talk about that. Look, congratulations, you're you know now working for a, a big company. So it's all turned out okay. Yeah. And then a lot of the guys, um, I mean, this is this is just tip of iceberg stuff, you know. I mean, we've had more than 100 complaints against some of these guys. I think 13 tutors and masters have now gone, have been sentenced. Mm -hmm. um, but it becomes pretty clear in that typical New Zealand um, uh, fashion that a lot of people have just locked up the thoughts, thrown away the key, and we'll never discuss it. One of the interesting aspects of this is that the theory about the pedophile cabal there operating there because we know i mean 13 masters as i just said have have been um you know have been sentenced mm. for pedophilia um but how many more are there and were there and did this just suddenly suddenly this just started in the early 70s i think not you know i think that it goes way 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 back but we'll never know that really because you know, those those generations ago, guys, they're in their 70s now, and maybe it goes back further than that. The school's been going since early 1900s. Mm. And, you know, unless you do a microfish um, um, uh, uh, check in the New Zealand Herald Library, but I just don't, I, I can't see a 1920 headline talking about pedophilia, you know, even, no. if, a kid did come, even if a kid did come forward. It so been kept under the covers, yeah, even more so. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, I think that, um, you know, it was up to me to do it. Uh, because now was, was the time, because a lot of these guys can't, they can't face it, they can't, and they know they're going to get redressed from Dilworth, but mm -hmm. I think that Dilworth is just going to try and rush or right over them, you know, and mm -hmm. so they need some strong people to actually stand up and say, yeah, that's, no, no, that's not happening, mm -hmm. and Dilworth still believes, I, I, I believe, that this is all just going to disappear, you know, and off it'll go, and they'll go back to the Auckland Club and have a glass of sherry at night and, um, you know, and enjoy their Remuera Lodges, so it's, um, yeah, and the response has been fantastic. I've heard from uh, boys at, at school that have, uh, you know, that I was friends with at the time, right. who I don't even remember, which is another aspect to this. A lot of that stuff has come back to me, right? And, and I just sort of memory hold it. And mm. then it's like, oh my God, this happened. And, mm. you know, working on this project, it was, it was going to be a film, but we think we're going to turn it into a mini series because we've got so much material. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a number of the boys, you know, and well, men now, I guess I could still keep, we call them the lost boys. And, um, and they have reminded me of things that happened, events that I was involved with at school that I had no, I have no memory of. One of those, for instance, is that, you know, I went to the Sunday news or tried to go to the Sunday news to report this. Um, but this abuse, um, but before that, and I had no memory of this, I'd gone to the headmaster, I'm sorry, I have memory of going to the headmaster and reporting the abuse, but I didn't, re didn't remember that I'd actually set up a petition and had gone round boy to boy right. to get these kids signed for the, for the reverend to be removed from his, from his job. And I, I just, to this day, I'm still going, really, I did that? And they're like, yes, you certainly did. So yeah. isn't it strange the way you, the brain works, right? It just shuts, just goes, I've got too much going on. I'm just shutting that out. I'm going to Well, of course you are, because it's such a, such a painful memory. So the reverend yeah. you're talking about, the thing that struck me the most, the thing that horrified me was when you tried to actually bring it to people's attention, they put him in charge of you. Yeah. For goodness sakes. Yeah. And so the assaults continued.
You must have but felt that, like you'd, you'd absolutely gone back to square one and felt dreadful. There was a certain amount of betrayal there, yeah, absolutely. But look, you, you've got to in some ways place it in time. This is the early 70s. There'd be no Catholic church abuse coming out yet. I'd never, you know, I had no idea what the word pedophile meant. I'd never heard it before in my life. Why would you? Mm -hmm. So actually naming what was going on was difficult in the first place. But it was all about the cover-ups, all about simply the Dewitt's reputation. Um, but now it's moved on to the sphere of, you know, they don't want to pay out um, as much as they should for some of the boys who've gone through horrific abuse. Look, I'm not the only one by any stretch. Mm -hmm. um, but that, but my story seems to be repeated on many levels for the other boys. Um, I was, the guy who's in charge of the redress, uh, the, the boys redress program has interviewed them all and has got a whole lot of um, statistics. And okay. it's something like of 40 boys who contacted him, let's say 50, mm -hmm. 22 reported it up the ranks at Dilworth and nothing happened, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there are these bizarre stories about a boy reporting it and then home on the holidays and the headmaster knocking on the door and sitting down with the mother and saying to the mother, you know, this is, he's, he's telling lies. We've got to be careful. Otherwise we're not going to be able to keep him at school. Mm. And, you know, it's, you're going to be buying school uniforms and hockey, hockey sticks from now on. Mm. And remember a lot of these mothers did not have, did not have any money. Mm -hmm. I've got my with application mm. here and my mother, um, my mother's, um, had to fill out a whole lot of forms and stuff. And her her wages were in the, you know, less than $100 a week, right? Oh. So, it's, so it's, I mean, it, they had no choice. And to, the, and to them, uh, Dilworth School was a, was a gift from heaven. Right? Yeah, it seemed to, of course. It was heaven, you know? I, met, I met your mother and, um, you know, she was great. And I, I, bet, I bet she felt at that time she was like, oh, this is so wonderful. I've got this boy and he's got all this potential and this is going to be just the best thing for Mark, you know. And you probably thought that too. Well, look, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's a weird, weird time in your life. I was, I was slight, you know, slightly rebellious kid, although Dilworth set me off on a much more kind of um, chaotic and mayhemic kind of future. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> yeah. rebelling. There's yeah. a word for it it's called contumacious. It means a stubborn resistance to authority. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where that came from for me um, because of what occurred at the school. And look, yeah. with my mother, we never discussed that till the day she died. We didn't discuss it. And so that has robbed me of, a, of, a, of an entire relationship to my mother because what I now realise, and I've been told by other boys, is that they didn't, when, when my mother was called in, I thought, you know, naturally, that we we're going to discuss this with the headmaster. Mm. The headmaster talked to her first. And basically what happened was... Um, was they lied to her and didn't say anything about what was going on and just said I was misbehaving, right? Yeah, you're a naughty and boy. Yeah. It's you know, being naughty. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I was a mischievous wee tyke, you know. And um and whereas I thought they discussed it and my mother didn't bring it up. So what the hell was going on? How dare mm. they, you know? Mm -hmm. mm. So it was a it's it ruptured a lot of families. Um and um, you know, and they've they've got to own up to it and and talk to talk about the cover up and talk to the cover up. Mm. Just what, now, yep, sorry, Karen. I was just going to say, what do you think about, so there's an inquiry, right, and you've got Dame Sylvia Cartwright taking this. Well, what is that going to achieve? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, inquiries, I'm, I don't know what they achieve. There yeah, was yeah. a huge pedophile inquiry in Australia, right? And yeah. I, I don't know if that achieves is anything different. I'm not sure, maybe. I mean, I, I don't know. The thing about this inquiry, however, is that it's a bit like the, a bit like the fox guarding the hen house, right? Because mm -hmm. the um, because Dilworth have set it up, right? So yeah. Dilworth has put themselves, slotted themselves into the position of actual being judge and, and jury on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are going to decide what the redress is. Yeah. They're the ones who will decide whether, you know, who's interviewed, what's said, what's publicised, all that sort of stuff. And, I mean, that just, that's, to me, that's, you know, just ridiculous yeah. on the face of it, right? You can't have the foxes running that kind of thing. Um, but, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I guess it's great... It's uh, Sylvia Cartwright and the other woman. I can't remember her name. Yeah, I should um, check that. I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head, Mark, actually. but um, she's, a Q she's a QC. She's got a good reputation. Right. Um, but, I mean, the latest is that DeWitt is putting aside a certain amount of money to pay redress to these kids, hmm. some of whom, and, I mean, I just really hope that that it's not just them. It's some of these suicides over the years, right? I hope yeah. their money, they're, 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 they get some rest from this. Hmm. Um and so, and so they're putting aside a certain amount of money. How can you do that when you don't know how many complaints and you haven't, you haven't juried the, the whole situation yet? So yeah. it's just, 
it's already got the sniff of a typical cover-up that they've been doing for clearly 50 years, you know? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we're, we're a bit sceptical about the whole thing. Yeah, but they're, they're about to discover that we ain't going away. So that's, the you know, the other thing. I think they, as I say, they still just think it's just going to poof, disappear, and everything's going to go back to normal. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's so sad because, I mean, that school, obviously... I mean, I guess there were good intentions at the outset. One would like, you'd like to think that it was a pretty wholesome place to begin with, although there's some creepy comments, weren't there, from a couple of the of the um, the church men saying things like, it's a place where you can hug a boy, and, and it was like, ooh, alarm bells. So you wonder whether it became known amongst the community, the teaching community. They were like, ooh, I can I can have, you know, have be a part of this. There's all these yeah, people. Well, and, you that- know... That repellent Jabba the Hutt Anglican minister you, you're talking about yeah. is famous Ross Brown, and he's about to be sentenced, I believe. He's been found guilty on several counts, mm. and he took over from Peter Taylor, the guy who was abusing me, yeah. and by all accounts was a mutt, was a monster, right? Was just absolutely repellent. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, you think about a, deal with, a documentary deal with me called Boys to Men years mm. and years ago, and they interview him. I mean, this is, the irony is just, super 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 sweet and yeah. he's talking about how it's a great place for boys and you know as you say we'll give you a hug if you're down and it's like mm-hmm. yeah you a lot more than that you know yeah because they preyed on you gotta remember the boys had nowhere to go we were there as boarders mm. we didn't um we only left at home we left for home leave on saturdays and sundays mm. and when i first started there we only went home for a few hours on sunday right oh really and then you'd wake up on sunday morning Mm. And you'd realise that you've got to go back to this, yeah, back to this goddamn crucible of fear and dread. And um, you know, it was all awful. And then oh. you'd be dropped off at the gates by your mum, yeah. so mostly mum involved. Mm. And um, and mm. uh, there we'd be, there you'd be stuck. There's no escape, right? There's no no escape from that place. Mm. It's a, there's a reason. There's a huge fence around the playgrounds. Mm. Yeah, dreadful. You how how young were you when when the assaults first happened? Um, I was. So I left when I was 13. Yeah. So, and, and that it had been going on for, I don't know, you know, 18 months. Mm. Uh, and, and looking back, it was, I, I actually escaped. I was, I was lucky because, um, because a lot of those boys, they had multiple abuses. Mm. And, um, and then there is just, there's also a kind of a suspicion that boys were passed around. There was definitely collusion between these guys, right? Yeah. They, 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 they targeted and um, groomed and then, you know, had, did what they did. And they actually the, had full, it wasn't like, the thing that shocked me was, it was full sex, wasn't it? It wasn't just a, a quick yeah, grow. Yeah. It was. I mean, so some was worse than others. Yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, but it was, yeah, I mean, it was the whole smorgasbord of, uh, <laughs> of oh, pederast. Yes, it's, no, it's just, yeah. I mean, think oh. about it. They, they had a kid farm there, you know, and yeah. no one, and after the first couple of times, obviously, that it was reported and nothing happened. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it was heaven for them. Mm. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Awesome. And hell for the boys. And like you say, you know, you're obviously a strong guy. You pushed through. You had a, you, you went on to have a great career. You're still having you know a great life. You're a success story, but a lot of them don't have such don't have those happy stories. You know. Well, I think that you know it's the, the, look. I've had a hell of a lot of contact with boys, and there sort of seems to be two or three camps, right? Yeah. So there's the guys that that um that dealt with it in some way, and that might that might might have meant having multiple therapists and having a some sort of, you know, kind of under Jesus moment or whatever it was. Mm. And then there are others who never, ever recovered, right? And then there are some who never, uh, some who recovered and, then, sorry, fell over and then got up again. Um, and I guess we all to a certain degree fell over, but mm. some just never came back from the abyss. And, uh, and it completely ruined their, their lives, their relationships. Mm. And, you know, apart from suicides, just, it, it, just awful, awful stuff mm. that, that, didn't only impact them, obviously, it impacted everybody they loved yeah. and uh, families, families friends, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So it, it's really, it, it is, at the core of it, it's evil because, because they knew what was going on. Mm-hmm. And what drives someone to actually abuse a kid is, is kind of fascinated me my entire life yeah. because... It's such it's the it's the biggest victim crime of all, apart from murder, let's say. So they're all absolutely aware. I don't think any of them were like, oh, it's um, you know, they like it and it's gonna make them stronger, better men, and they're gonna grow up in our communities. And you know, that that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that there had to be, you know, um fallout from it, but mm-hmm. still 
still, even risking being, you know, unmasked, mm. they went ahead with it. So it's interesting how powerful these this this you know this is this pedophilia. It's um mm. it, it drives mm. them beyond all recognition to pursue. You were super young, yeah. 11, 12 years old, for goodness sakes. You know, I mean, most kids haven't even gone, you know, like even 13 is very young, but there you were 11, 12, that deal with being repeatedly abused. Mm. And, and he took you to, ooh, he didn't, he, was he take, taking you to the church or to the chapel to do this? Yeah, that, that was his peccadillo. It was um, the altar in the chapel, which of course was his domain, you know, mm. and he would couch it in religious terms and talk about the love Jesus had for his disciples and all this sort of nonsense, right? But of course, you know, at, at my age, I thought, okay, well, sure. I mean, it was shocking and it was disturbing. And it, every time it occurred, it, it was, you know, it took me to a kind of a dark, dark place. Mm-hmm. And I became, you know, I became very, um, I, it, it, it destroyed me in terms of a human being, you know. Mm-hmm. I um, had no understanding of 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 what you know of what i should have been doing at that age in life as you say it's really young you know mm. i should be playing cricket and doing dumb shit with my friends you know mm. instead there was this horror this constant dread and fear that i lived in mm. because this guy was inescapable you know mm. he was mm. it was there and he was in charge of you and plus when yeah. you complained you got punished you got caned yeah, um, more than that. They had quite a nasty, um, a nasty disciplinary action to deal with called Coventry. Yeah. And, um, and only a few schools have this, and mostly kind of British boarding schools, public schools. Yeah. And that meant that you were put on Coventry for a couple of days or a day or a week yeah. in extreme cases, and that meant that you were invisible and that you, no one could have any contact with you during that time. No one acknowledged you. Nobody looked at you. Even in class, the teachers weren't allowed to say anything. So, in for a, you know, so for that period of time, you were literally a, um, you know, invisible. You were the Walking Dead, and and that was the hardest, I think, of all. Yeah. I didn't mind getting caned. It's like whatever. It's all yeah. gone soon. Um, mm. But I was caned a lot. You know, I was I was constantly being beaten, and um, and the, and the Coventry thing was disturbing because imagine, you know, a garrulous 10, 11, 12 year old boy, yeah. um, living in a world where he 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 wasn't seen. It's very difficult. I think most boys will attest to the fact that yeah. um, attest to the fact that Coventry was the worst of all yeah. discipline. Do you know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like being put into solitary, solitary confinement in your own body. Like how yeah. hideous! Really that is, that is this, cool. you know, Yeah, and in fact, the first title for the movie, as I was writing it, was I called it "Surrounded in, Sol- in Solitary." Mm. And um, because of that, it really did feel like that. And mm. it's and it's but it, there is a surreal a surrealness to it. Because you can, you know, you're you're this ghost who walks, right? You you're a ghost in in amongst all the kids, people, teachers, yeah. tutors, and no one can see you or, or even talk uh. to you. And if if anyone did and they were caught, they were then put on Coventry. Mm, so pretty sick, actually, isn't it? It's totally sick. It sounds it sounds it sounds barbaric, actually. And and what what's what the the thing that makes me most angry is that you know, is the poor mums who. You know, who was struggling, and the, and they thought that the school was the answer to their prayers, and and you know, yeah, it's just horrible. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, look, you're, and I realise this more now that I'm a parent. I mean, and, yeah. and Leanne, you're a mum, yeah. and you know that you would jump in front of a truck for that boy of yours, yeah, right? You would absolutely. be you're probably yeah. the only person in the world ever that you would throw your life down without even a moment's hesitation, right? Mm-hmm. Without, without even thinking about it. Right. So these mothers, that's what they believe they were doing for us. Yeah. They were providing us with, with you know, a great education and uh, they point to all the famous old boys. Oh, look, there's a governor general. There's a, you know, what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, I yeah. mean, not that I'd ever want to be governor general anyway. That was like getting out of this place. Um, and so so they thought they were doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, but the, the 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 part that kind of sticks in my craw was they were lied to a lot of the time, and so I, we kids felt that we were betrayed by them because they were told about what was going on but never did anything about it. Okay. However, some did know, you know, some mothers some did parents, know. Some parents, some mothers well, did know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Some mothers did know, and um, uh, one of an old boyfriend of mine who. Is uh, you know has gone through a similar kind of thing that I I did at the school. Mm-hmm. He just and a lot of this you memory hole. I mentioned that earlier. Mm-hmm. You just don't remember stuff, mm-hmm. um, and I think your brain's just hidden it away, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he he talks about he only remembered it in the last month or so, 
And up until this moment, he'd always believed that his mother had never known about what was going on. He'd never mm-hmm. told her, right, because of the humiliating aspects of it. Mm-hmm. He maintained, he, he had a me- got the memory back. He was talking to a mm-hmm. friend of his, his friends with, at school, mm-hmm. who reminded him of the fact that he had come up to this guy's place mm-hmm. and sat at dinner with his mother mm-hmm. and talked about what had been going on at the school, right? Wow. And, and the guy had completely forgotten this. But now he knows that his mother knows because yeah. another boy there, you know, was there at the, at the table and talked about it. Right. So that, that's, you know, there, there was that that went on too. But it just shows you what a powerful grip, you know. I mean, 1970s Auckland, you know, it's just yeah. mm. there was the, none of this stuff was even mm. even dreamt of, you know. Mm. Actually, yeah, no, I mean, 1970s New Zealand was a very backward place. You know, and I tell people, listen, I, yeah, yeah, I tell people it honestly did. I mean, those Muldoon years, right? It <laughs> seemed like it seemed like it could be the Soviet Union, to be honest. I mean, it really <laughs> could. True, true. People don't understand the isolation that Auckland felt. Auckland just felt. Yeah, I think I remember so. growing up and just going, "How the hell do I get out of this place?" Yeah, right. Um, yeah, and then things improved, but it was like for a, quick, a decade there and and yep. before it really was. It could have been Kamchatka, you know, except <laughs> for the weather. Yeah. Do you know, you're right, because, like, um, you know, Auckland's good now. It's multicultural. It's it's pretty yeah. vibrant. You know, you I don't know when you were last back. When did you last return to New Zealand? I was there about five years ago. Oh, yeah. we were well now, hey. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. things, are, no, things are better still. You know, I, I, I um, yeah, when I, I, I'm with you, like, I lived in London and I came back to, to Auckland and I was like, good God, I want to leave again. It's so boring. You know, where are all the people? You know, and I, I had that real cultural cringe. I was like, I don't want to be, you know, it just felt really dull in my 20s to be living there. But I think it's changed a lot. It's a way better city and things are improved. But But I can see what you're up against in the 70s. And you know you're just this little little kid, and you you were such a sweet little boy. You're just such a lovely. I'm looking at these photos of you, and um, you know when you were just a youngin, with your crop of blonde hair, and you know like you said okay. you're pretty you're pretty garrulous. You you always seem to be quite a confident person. So I wonder how you got that. I mean, most people will go through this, and and I don't know, just wouldn't like you say. Some people haven't come out the other side. You know. I know. You know. I mean, that's the question, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And I think that um, you know, I didn't think about this for years and years and years. And funnily enough, when I was working on the radio in Auckland, and I guess I was in my early 20s, maybe this was 1988 Mm -hmm. or so, Mm -hmm. we did a, the the guy I work with the radio on, another Mark, on 89FM, we did this kind of morning promotion called Taking It to the Streets. Right. And we just went out out with with microphones and stopped people in the street and had a chat to them on the way to work. Yeah, nice. Uh, Which sounds very annoying if I was one of those people. But that's (laughs) Yeah, that's what, what jocks do. It's going to be at work in five seconds, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. one of the places I suddenly find, found myself in was in front of Dilworth School because I was doing a roving kind of oh, report. Yeah. And I remember looking up at the A-frame, that iconic A-frame that's there. Mm-hmm. And um, and at the school, when I first arrived there, I used to, I had this huge thing about Edmund Hillary. Mm. And, um, and so I equated, to get me through hard times, the A-frame with the pinnacle of Everest, right? Right. And... But but in those intervening years from when I left Dilworth at the age of 13 or 14, all the way up through, say, now I'm in my mid-20s, I just, I hadn't thought about it. I just didn't even think about um, think about my life at Dilworth. And then because I had this you, you moment. Effectively, you effectively just blocked it. You blocked it out. Yeah, yeah. It, was too, yeah. it was too traumatic. I think that's what happened. And then oh, uh, and yeah. then on this particular morning, on this particular port, uh, report. I find myself in front of the A-frame, yeah. and I did this. I did a cross. Hey, we're here with here's a couple of boys. Let's have a chat. You know, all that sort of, that sort of radio BS that goes on. Um, and um, and then when I finished, I had this moment yeah. because it must have just been. I looked up at the A-frame, and went, "Oh my god, that's right." Yeah. And um, anyway, that sort of screwed me for a for the rest of the show. I didn't couldn't really couldn't operate. concentrate. Yeah, I couldn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, but then, you know, prior to that, as I say, nothing, I just didn't, I just didn't want to think about it. Mm. And I, maybe I'm a very good compartmentalizer. I don't know. It's, um, it's, and thank God, I think to a certain degree, because a lot of those boys 
couldn't and they you know they paid the price man and and i just so i thank god for some reason my brain doesn't operate like other people's so i'm happy about that you know it's got it's got good and bad points right (laughs) exactly you know the lovely thing was is when you said you know when you finally got free because they actually after all of your efforts you know you you were ringing newspapers and you were you were getting on the phone and then and then they'd rip the phone off you and you couldn't actually complain and then finally they they expelled you didn't they and you said it was the happiest day of your life Look, this was one of the things I was, you know, I think that, you know, as I mentioned, I was a fairly rebellious little contumacious asshole. And that would have been the way even if this hadn't happened. But when, you know, when this started occurring and I went the first time to the headmaster and reported it and was caned and put on Coventry and back into the care of the the minister for my effort, I then realised... I then realised that the only way, and my mother was called and she was adamant that I stay at this wonderful establishment. Yeah. I then realised that the only way I was going to get out of there, I wasn't going to get out because, um, you know, my mother was going to let me out. The only way I was going to get out was, was to be expelled. Mm-hmm. So henceforth, starting a petition at the school to get the, rid of the minister, paying the price on that, and then my final desperate act, and it really was, yeah. was... Um, was uh, going to the Sunday News. And I said, you know, I said to a friend of mine at the time, I don't care what happens about this because they're going to expel me no matter bloody what, right? I've really pushed I've really pushed them into getting rid of me. And that's what happened. Yeah. The, the, um, the Sunday newspaper guy, uh, the journalist, only said a few words to him before mm. a tutor hung up. There was only one phone in the whole school that I could right. use. Yeah. And it was down in a in a, an assembling area in a little phone booth. So we had to plan it so that uh, my friend <laughs> kept, it was a military operation. Oh. My friend, kept the roving tutor of the night, who was right. my, who was a user, right. um, away from me as I snuck into this phone booth. I mean, the first thing we had to do was get the phone number, right? I mean, this is the days of phone books. Yeah, right. And yeah, it would be impossible to get okay. a phone. Yeah. Get a phone number. So we had to sneak into the into a, into um the first the uh the the matron's office mm. rip the page out of the sunday news yeah. under under the guise of i'm not feeling very well right and then and then we had to organize it so that i could make the call right now i made the call and the guy answered and i said listen i'm calling from an auckland school where i can't remember if i said there's terrible abuse happening and then the tutor got me and so the yeah. next morning um uh the headmaster and and the upper echelons yeah. knew what had happened, right? They didn't quite, they think they, I think they thought they got me before I said too much. Right. However, the final, and I think that that would have been, I, they probably maybe wouldn't have even expelled me then. However, the canny Sunday news reporter just started calling around boarding schools in Auckland because I guess there's, a, there's only right. 20 of them. Them. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. I was in the headmaster's office <laughs> yeah. when I get addressed down for what the hell was I, you know, did I think I was doing spreading these lies? And yes. the phone rang and his his reception secretary woman said, you know, Mr. Parr, there's a reporter here from the Sunday News. Mm-hmm. And that was it. I was out. I was out straight away. That was it. Boom. My mother came and picked me up and I was gone. And I never yes. looked, you know, never looked back. Never yes. looked back. Yes. Did, did the Sunday News, Crazy, actually, right? did they end up um, breaking that story? No, they didn't. Mm. And this is another indication of what, you know, what Auckland was like back in those days, right? Mm. Mm. He denied it. Well, I've no idea what you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And the guy who had 15, 20 schools to call Mm. just kind of gave up and went, well, okay, Mm. that's nice. Thanks very much. Um, I don't think that would happen nowadays. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I think that it would have, um, if if that phone call had gone down, I don't even know if the Sunday news exists anymore. Yeah, but but it um, does. But, you know, you're right. It, it would have been sniffed out. It, people would have been onto it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. of course, we're we're you know we're we're used to dealing with this sort of stuff, and we know what has what needs to happen. But back yeah. in those days, yeah, yeah just uh, just a flat denial from you know the headmaster of Dilworth was enough, so it saved their asses. But it yeah. saved mine as well because I got out, and I'm you sure, mm. yeah, if um, mm. I'd stayed there longer, I mean, I don't know what would have happened to me. Life was life was you know, pretty bloody awful. Yeah. But um, things the thing about doing this, things could always get worse, you know, yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute shocker. Do you have a lot to do with, um, you know, I really enjoyed uh, the other the other men who spoke the other night, Neil Harding and was it, um, was it Kieran? Yeah, was I don't know that younger guy. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I'm, Kieran you know, Smith, he, he was, it was very moving. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the he, terrible story. Yeah. That was Ross Brown. That was that was his abuser. Was Ross Brown, right? Mm-hmm. The minister who came after mine. Yeah. Um, they've got a bit of a taste for it. It seems those those ministers. 
Mm. Uh, once again, I think the job attracts those types of type of people, right? Mm. It's um, that's the unfortunate thing. Unfortunately, yes, and it's um, this, but this this is a dreadful one because of because of the element of of boys being slightly vulnerable or coming from homes that you know couldn't support them, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, right. and it's just so it, it's but, but how how great that these boys and yourself included have pushed through. And you've, you know, you've you've had incredible, an incredible life yourself, you know, with lots of different experiences. And now, so you're gonna, it's gonna be pretty tricky, isn't it? Like writing, writing this um, mini series. Do you find it must be quite painful at times? I it mean, it is. It's a really, it's the oddest, oddest. The I've written lots of biopics <clears throat> over my years in LA. Yeah. But writing an auto biopic is a, is a, it's trippy, man. It's really trippy, yeah. especially since I um, am constantly being barraged with with information from non boys mm. and which makes me go and this is why we've moved it to a mini series which mm. makes me go oh god i've forgotten about that that's right they did that and or you know whatever yeah okay the petition was one of them me yeah. starting a petition um and i had no knowledge or memory of it yeah and um and so it's a, it's a this weird sick evil movable feast that just gets worse you <laughs> keeps know it's growing um, so you keep uncovering new things what about the crypt um which was the secret club kind of thing which i think kieran mentioned do you do you know you know I about had nothing that? to do with that but once again yeah. who knows yeah. maybe but yeah. no i uh, i don't i don't even really recognize where that was because in yeah. the cha chapel somewhere right yes yeah so some sort yeah. of you know club and and that's where the, the boy and he was taken to be groomed you know so it's a specific area so there's these awful terms covent coventry and the crypt and the isn't it and it's all cloaked in religion it must make you so angry about religion and what it does to people in a way yeah and i've been through i've been through that phase of it as well you know i mean yeah. i just i i um i mean you know the older you get the more spiritual you get to a certain degree mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. yes it, it's always made me slightly skeptical of christianity for sure <laughs> um yeah and the reasons the reasons for it being here uh yeah i mean look it, it upends so many aspects of your life that it is difficult to i mean the, some of these other boys and me or you can tell i've got a fairly dark sense of humor about it yeah right and sure, that's a defense device you know that that's that helps me but mm -hmm. we, we we're all kind of if you don't laugh you cry by this stage right Absolutely. we're in our 50s and we've we've been through the worst of it and now it's just time to to get some payback first for those voiceless ones the, the boys who can't speak the boys who can't articulate what they went through but yeah. went through just yeah. as much you know yeah. and yeah. Uh, i don't mind being their mouthpiece yeah, great. Well, good on you. And so, so just finally, let's talk about so your life now. So, apart from obviously writing the mini series, you're based yep. in Amsterdam. You have got two lovely yep. children. Yes, yes, yes. That's that's yes. cool. And you're quite busy with them, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Um, you know, we lived I lived in the in the states for 25 years, and we've moved here recently. Ooh. And I love it. It's a great town. And my kids are I've got a 16 year old boy and an 11 year old girl. Yeah. And uh, you know, they're great. We we um, spend a lot of time together. And uh, I mean, parenthood, as you know, is a joy, right? I mm. mean, it's just it's the reason for us being here it's to a best. certain degree. Yeah, it's great. And uh, yeah. and it's I, it's funny actually. My boy was at primary school, elementary school in Atlanta, mm. and was telling uh us stories were telling me in particular i mean my 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 pedo radar goes up right oh yeah Just, of course it will uh-huh i'm like hang on <laughs> so anyway there was a story about the music teacher there right having having meetings with my son who was uh -huh. then at the age of 11 yeah. in his office in his classroom with both doors closed uh. and so i'm like what why, yeah. why is that's the stuff. I mean, because like, that's exactly what happened to me. And yeah. uh, anyway, he had, he was 11, had no understanding of what was going on, but he was definitely being groomed. And uh, so what? I contacted the school. Oh, yeah, yes. Oh, contacted the school. And, um, and then um, we, my wife and I were going to go in and have a, con a conversation about this with the headmaster. Oh, and nice. then for some reason, the meeting was postponed. Yes. And, um, and um, then we tried, tried to make another meeting. And two days later, that, that guy, we hadn't said anything yet, yeah. that teacher, they did exactly to him what they normally do. They just moved him on to another school. So wow. obviously there have been other complaints from other parents. But instead of unmasking this mofo and, you know, and uh, actually making him face the law, he got moved on to another elementary school in a different state, yeah. as Peter Taylor did. You know, as Ross Brown did, he went down to Manorewa College, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know carried on his ways. I mean, that, and that to me makes that makes me feel sick. Yeah, I'll that you. that they are aiding and abetting these guys, right? Oh. I mean, as a grown up, as a parent, we don't yeah. have many jobs in our lives, right? They aren't yeah. really important ones, but one of them is making Protecting. sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. that's it. Yeah. That's it. Right. 
Yeah, it makes me angry. Yeah, very much so. I'll be, I'll be. And you know, so he's he's happy and he's he's going to school in Amsterdam, I presume. And yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're uh, doing all the school thing, naughty school things that that kids do. And it's uh, you know, it's a very different life from from we were talking before about isolated Auckland. Mm. I um, annoy them both by talking about the fact that when I was your age yeah. in Auckland, um, so the you know the kids are going away to Mallorca and Portugal and, and Tuscany <laughs> this year for their holidays. Well. And I said, and so of course I say, well, when I was your age, I was going, going on holiday every single year to Red Beach. You know? <laughs> so so it's, it's, a diff, it's a different life, of course. They, it's not they, the they, same, is it? Or we the eye roll and stuff like that. Yeah, no, life is different now, you know, for these guys. Yeah. They're international, yeah. international yeah. kids. It's, it's um, a pretty cool thing. I think, I think it's fantastic because I think it makes a very well-rounded human, you know, to expose yeah. them to, to to the world, um, even even in its last crazy couple of years or whatever. But um, you know, clearly, um, you know, you've got through and, and things are good. But I can't wait to see what happens next with your um, with the mini series. So I think we need to keep in touch. Yeah, absolutely, we, yeah. we will, and I'll let you know. I mean, it's going through the very boring stage at the moment where I'm sitting just in front of a, in a dark room in front of a computer. Yes. Um, but that's that's you know that's that's where the true magic occurs, of, of course. course. But um, yes. but, but um, <laughs> as a storyteller, that's that's always my line. The writing is the most important part of any movie, yeah. um, or mm-hmm. series. But yeah, so look, it's early days, and mm-hmm. um, I'm just pleased we found a home with with a production company in New Zealand who's supporting me doing it, yeah. and um, and it's a story that must has to be told with you know universal kind of um, qualities. So. We'll yeah, it's it's um it's a dark story. It's disturbing, but it's important, you know. Mm. Yeah. And uh, that's where the interview, the chat with Mark Stauffer ends uh, or ended uh, last night on that uh, late night Zoom. Uh, but very, like I said, uh, I'm sure a lot of you would have found that quite, quite powerful and shocking. Some of the things that happened to Mark. And it's interesting to note that Dilworth has um, has got a, a new web page, uh, the Dilworth Response uh, to uh, the Horrors of the Past, and it's headlined Acknowledging and Reconciling Our Past. And in it, Dilworth says it's committed to fully confronting the sexual and other abuse that occurred at its school openly and honestly. As part of their response, the Dilworth Trust Board is commissioning an independent inquiry and establishing an independent redress program. Uh, the inquiry will provide an understanding of the causes, nature and extent of the abuse experienced by former students and ensure that current and future pupils continue to be safe, cared for and supported to thrive at the school, which obviously Mark didn't experience. The redress program it says, is designed to support the old boy survivors through various forms of redress, including financial awards, access to counselling and therapy, an apology and other forms of personalised redress. Dilworth is committed to understanding and recognising the impact of the abuse experienced at the school in the lives of old boy survivors, their families and the wider Dilworth community. And in that chat with Mark, we were discussing the inquiry, which is headed up by the Honourable Dame Sylvia Cartwright, and her co-inquirer is Francis Joy Child, QC. Uh, both uh, women uh, have considerable experience. Uh, Dame Sylvia, of course, our 18th Governor-General and uh, New Zealand's first female district court judge in 1989 and the first female high court judge in 93. While Frances Joy Child is a senior barrister with extensive experience in cases of sexual abuse, she has more than 25 years of expertise in issues relating to human rights, professional negligence, sexual harassment and bullying and abuse and assault. So that inquiry actually starts its work formally on the 1st of July in a couple of days and it intends to provide its report and recommendations to the Dilworth Trust Board before the end of this year. And then the report will be made publicly available in a manner they say that protects the privacy of old boy survivors along with any redactions as recommended by the inquiry chair. So that is going to be one to follow, isn't it, uh, when it gets underway on the 1st of July. Uh, so many boys uh, impacted by this and so many families and particularly distressing the other night to see the mum of one of these boys uh, just so distressed because her son has become uh, a pee addict, I think a drug addict anyway, and uh, she she fears for his, his future. Uh, she said that the boy who went into Dilworth came out a changed person 
unsurprisingly, and it's heartbreaking to hear about some of these stories. So um, I will keep you posted on the story and also in terms of um, Mark's progress with this miniseries and where it's going to be screened.